like the revolution is alive and well. Yeah! There's a lot of spirit. This is, this is wonderful. Tyler, thank you for that very nice introduction. Before I get started, I want to introduce two members of my family with me tonight. My wife, Carol, and a granddaughter, Linda. Right here. different part of California up in Chico and uh, we had a little rally up there and uh, they set a record they set a record with a number of people coming out but the record has been broken tonight Liberty cannot be squelched. It's going to continue to spread. It is, and it's a wonderful message, well, and you. I am so delighted that the young people of this country are, sp are responding so favorably. So thank you very much for your interest in this cause. So this morning, after we had that wonderful rally last night and a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of cheering, uh, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll check the internet to find out what kind of stories were written. Well, one story, you know, we we had, it, it, is, it is very, There's a crowd very accurate to say that we had over 6,000 people really there. Loud. So I came across one story and said, they had hundreds of people at Chico. <laughs> Well, it wasn't all that bad because somebody reported there were a thousand. So, <laughs> but but the headline actually was uh, a little bit more catching. The head, headline said, "Where is Ron Paul? What do we hear from him?" And yet here we just had that rally. So tonight, I hope we're able to send a message where they do hear from us and know that we're here. message is spreading very well. If we compare it to two years ago, four years ago, or ten years ago, it's dramatically different and it's growing exponentially. And there's a good reason for that. Not only is it a great message, the message of liberty, but there's a deep need for it in this country. We're seeing the consequence of not following our Constitution and not being dedicated to the cause of liberty. We have a mess the answers can be found in our Constitution and in the understanding of what individual liberty is all about. I think the most important issue in the campaign or anything that we do it has to deal with the understanding and the promotion of individual liberty. Believing that if we truly understood that issue, uh, we would have a lot less problems. But when you go on the campaign trail, not a lot of people, other than an audience like this, have a great deal of concern for personal liberty. They have concern for the economy, and rightfully so, because that is a reflection, a bad economy is a reflection of a misunderstanding or a poor understanding about what economic liberty is all about. So we do have an economic crisis going on, but it was a predictable crisis. It shouldn't be that difficult to understand. We're in the midst of this, and yet the people in Washington have have not come around to understanding what the real problem is. And the problem is, boils down to about one thing. Government is way too big. The bigger the government, the less freedom that we have. And there's a lot of well-intentioned people, but you know where, uh, where good intentions might get you. Good intentions aren't en enough. The right ideas are critical. So there are a lot of good intentions that people want to do things to help other people. They want to spread our goodness around the world. But whether it's helping people here at home or making you behave in a certain manner or uh, improving the economy, uh, you cannot do it with the use of force. If we want to improve on our, ourselves and others, it has to be done by setting an example and doing it voluntarily and not using force. But that's exactly what 
happens when you have an economy that is a planned economy. We know what the extremes are. We know what extreme socialism is and what communism is all about because it's a failed system. And it was a predictable event that the Soviet system would collapse because they had a non-viable economic system. And fortunately, that is what brought the end to the Soviet system, not a nuclear war. It was a, it was a failed economic policy. And this is the reason that we ourselves must look at what we're doing, because we too have a failed economic system. It's not communism, it's called interventionism, where the planners in Washington, the do-gooders, the people who believe in welfareism and warfareism and inflationism and running up debt, they believe that they could do this forever. But guess what? The country went broke and it's not working and the people are realizing it. Not only are they losing their liberty, they're losing our, our, our ability to even take care of ourselves. So this is the reason the message that we have is the message that can solve our problems, whether it has to do with personal liberty or the economic crisis that we have, have today. crisis was brought about because the government was too big and spending too much money. But it was logical that the politicians would continue to do this because they kept getting reelected. The more they spent, the more they pretended they could bring home, even if they had to tax, borrow, or print the money, they were rewarded by re-election. Now that worked fine as long as we had money in the bank and we were a wealthy nation. But that's just changed now. We're a debtor nation. Uh, we're the biggest debtor in, uh, in the history of the world. We owe more money to foreigners than any other country has ever owed before. But the treasury is empty, it's difficult to extract the taxes, borrowing power is limited, and also there's going to be a limitation on how much our central bank can print money, and that is what we have to take care of and make sure that we don't finance government with the Federal Reserve System. have to be careful. Uh, Mr. Bernanke might hear us. <laughs> Boo. Now the, the uh, Federal Reserve has been around for a hundred years and you know with an election coming up if we do well in this election and we have the opportunity we should celebrate that 100 year anniversary by repealing the Federal Reserve Act. has caused a lot of mischief. Uh, once again, a lot of well-intentioned intellectuals thought that this was a wonderful thing to uh, come around and think you can debase the currency, dilute the value of the money, but that is nothing new. That is ancient. They accuse us of wanting to go back to something honest like a gold standard in the Constitution. The whole thing is, is paper money and debasement of the currency is ancient as well. It is very, very old and it's dishonest. If you or I duplicated the currency. It's called counterfeiting. When government does it, they call it good monetary policy. It nevertheless, morally, it's the same thing. It's counterfeiting your money and it should stop. But the very least that we have to do and the very first thing we have to do is have a full audit of the Federal Reserve. We need to find out who their friends are. achievement. Uh, many in this audience, I'm sure, helped get the audit uh, bill passed in the House last year. And, uh, of course, it didn't pass in the Senate, but we got a partial audit. We know more about the Fed than ever before. Matter of fact, I was uh, a bit shocked, even, even though I've been uh, very leery and concerned about monetary policy, I was still shocked to find out to the extent that they were involved. They were involved with $15 trillion of churning credit, bailing out their friends and buddies, not only in this country, but around the world. So 
this is a system that does not reward the middle class. Matter of fact, if you had only inflation, which is the destruction of a currency, and you just excluded everything else for the moment, destroying a currency destroys the middle class. The middle class lose it, and there's an automatic transfer of wealth from the middle class to the wealthy. And just look at what's happening today. But put that on top of a system that rewards the high-paid lobbyists, the people go to Washington and get the bailouts and the privileges, and then they have this fine, this housing bubble that was what was developed always for good intentions to make sure all the poor people had a house. Well, sure, a lot of poor people who didn't qualify ended up getting a house, but the wealthy kept getting wealthier. The Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac executives made billions, and many others made billions. Then they got into the derivatives uh, business, and then there was a collapse, as was predicted, and lo and behold, these individuals who had been running this bubble up started yelling and screaming, if you don't come and help us, we're too big to fail, you have to bail us out or there'll be a depression. <laughs> well, the thing of it is, there should have been a depression for them, not us. Yeah. So with all those good intentions and all this idea of entitlements uh, ended up the, the privileged and the wealthy were the entitled individuals. At the same time, the middle class suffered. They lost their jobs and look at how many houses are lost and, and look at the calamity of what has happened in the real estate. But this is a consequence of bad monetary policy and bad economic policy and a bad understanding. But we don't need to continue to do this. There's a better knowledge about monetary policy and economic system now than ever before. So there's reason to be hopeful that if we ever get our house in order and get our government back in the control of people who believe in, in government limitation and in our constitution, growth can be restored rather quickly. But if we continue to try to solve the problem of spending, too much debt, too much printing money, too much regulation, too much, and too much involvement, and then we have the crisis, and what did they do? They're gonna solve the problem by spending more money, borrowing more money, printing more money, taxing more money, and printing money. It, it doesn't work. You can't solve the problem that create by doing exactly the same thing that created our problem. So I think what we have to do is wake up someday and say that uh, this system has to be changed. We just can't patch it up. Because the Soviet system came apart because of economic reasons. Fortunately, we didn't have to fight the Soviets and have a nuclear exchange. But they failed because their system failed. And today, that is what we're witnessing. We're witnessing a failed system. We're witnessing a failure of liberal economic policy of the Keynesian variety that says that we should have a planned economy. And this is, uh, this is what we're facing up to, but there's no admission now in Washington that the country's broke. So we have been conditioned now for many, many decades that we go to the government and the government's going to bail everybody out. And there's, uh, and both parties argue the same case for different reasons. They all have their special interests. And, and, that, and it's worked for a while because our country was very wealthy and we had a lot of money in the bank. But now it's not the case. Now the, the conflict comes. Why don't these people get along together in Washington? For a very precise reason. They're fighting over a pie that is practically gone, a shrinking pie, there's no welfare, and yet they are still conditioned that all wealth has to be redistributed through the federal government. We have to wake up and say the government produces nothing, only free people produce. We need to free up our society. But the Federal Reserve System, in the way they are able to monetize debt, encourages the growth of big government. Because if we had to pay taxes, or we had to borrow the money and not print the money, this would all come to an end. I think for that, uh, and I did this just as to make a point, I introduced a bill one time to get rid of withholding taxes. Not that I really want to uh, uh, have anybody have to send in money to the government, because my real position on income tax is repeal the 16th Amendment. So you but the purpose, the purpose of repealing the withholding tax is to make the point that if we all had to send a check in every month to pay for the government we're getting, believe me, 
there would be a revolution in this country real soon and the people rebel and they wouldn't send the money in, there would be a lot of changes and people just have to realize how much this government is, uh, is costing us and it is costing us, us plenty. But, it, but the way the system works, borrowing delays the penalty and the inflation, of course, inflating the money supply delays it as well. But it also participates in allowing us to engage in other issues that we shouldn't be engaged in. And that is a deeply flawed foreign policy that has to be changed. things wrong with this administration and especially in foreign policy but the truth is the foreign policy that we have is a bipartisan there's too much compromise too much compromise in borrowing and spending and taxing and too much compromise on foreign policy they get together because they have the same foreign policy the rhetoric may be different at election times there may be con a belief that the parties are somewhat different but if you end up with a Republican or Democrat you have the same foreign policy of adventurism and, and involvement overseas and, and uh, uh, occupation So the real solution today is for us, and you especially, a younger generation, to decide, look, it's time to change our foreign policy. Why don't we look at the Constitution? There's no authority for us to occupy other nations and tell them what to do. So we should be in the There's no authority in the Constitution for the executive branch, in particular the president, to go to war without permission by the Congress and without a declaration of war. Just think of how much better off we would have been if we had not fought any of the wars since World War II because none of them were declared and none were really won. And we have lost and suffered from it. And yet, even today, we have the Secretary of Defense going before the committee and they say, well, where do you get this authority uh, to go to war? Oh, I get it from the United Nations and NATO. This was one of the major issues why the revolution was fought, to make sure the king couldn't go to war on his own and put the taxes on the colonists. They said, no way, it should only be by the people through the Congress to make these declarations. So right now, today, we have go our government's going to war under UN resolutions or under uh, NATO, but the reasons that they give are so, so disturbing. Right now, it's called preemptive war, that we're allowed to preempt another country and go to war. Preemptive war is a, is a word, it is a term that is used to soften aggression. That's what it really is. When you invade another country, it's aggression. In the, um, in the last four years, uh, in the last ten years, there's four trillion dollars added to our national debt due to the wars going on in the Middle East. I want to end those wars. End them quickly. We just marched in. Let's just march home. It's time to bring our troops home from around the world. World War II is over. It's time. It's time we come home from Korea. It's time we come home from Japan. It's come home from J Germany. Save billions and billions of dollars. Maybe we can take care of our people here at home a lot easier. And who knows, we may be better liked if we came home rather than telling other countries exactly what they should do.
Sometimes if you're an independent person, you run for the presidency, you get on a national stage and there are debates, sometimes you, uh, you, know, you can get some negative things thrown at you. But one day when we were talking about foreign policy, I made these suggestions because I thought it was reasonable. Why don't we just think about following uh, the golden rule in foreign policy? Don't do anything to any other country of the day if we don't want to have them do it to us. War principles also might be a big help to us. But you know, when I made that suggestion, the reaction wasn't the same as I get here. <laughs> because they did exactly the opposite. You know, they, wow, this is terrible. What kind of heresy is this? If you know. But there's a lot of reasons why we go to war. There's oil, there's influence from other countries, as well as there's influence from our oil companies, as well, that we send our troops over there to protect oil. And there's also a firm belief, and firm belief which has continued since Woodrow Wilson, making the world safe to democracy, that we are to spread our exceptionalism, even if it, it takes force because we are such an exceptional nation. Yes, we have been exceptional. We're not so exceptional now, but if we are truly an exceptional nation and run a good economy, have uh, civil, liberties, civil liberties here at home, and we have peace uh, that we contribute to, better pe men, then maybe they would emulate us and do it voluntarily, but we using force will not make them live the way we think they should. But under the, under the conditions of war, it's always easier for a government to undermine liberties here at home, and they have taken this advantage. We're in a war, it's a, it's, it's a pervasive war around the world, it's a global war on terrorism. Terrorism is still defined in the code, both nationally and internationally, as a crime. But now we're in war against everybody, any country in the world that we feel like dropping uh, uh, bombs on through our drones, we assume that we have this right to do this. Uh, matter of fact, there was an announcement today that we're going to have nuclear drones, that nu and these drones can stay up for months and months at a time. And they're also planning uh, in the... Uh, in the future sometime to have 30,000 of them flying around this country itself. 2015. Someday we'll have to remind a few, of them up, a few of them up there what the Fourth Amendment says. They're not supposed to be spying on us. They're supposed to protect our privacy. supposed to know what our government's doing all the time. And this, of course, is the reason why we have tried to protect whistleblowers and give them a little protection when they want to tell us what's really going on in our government. But guess what? The whistleblowers are mistreated when they do give us this information because they don't want us to know exactly what's going on with our government. And we do need to know. It's up to us to demand that we know what's happening in our government. But under, under these conditions of perpetual war, of course for perpetual peace, and that's the good motivation, uh, our presidents have done more things. I mean, just right after 9-11, because of the misunderstanding of that, they said, well, the American people must be too free, so we have to punish the American people, we have to spy on the American people. So the American people ended up getting more punishment than the people of, uh, hey, so what about that country that had 15 out of the 19 uh, terrorists? Uh, that, what do we do with them? Absolutely nothing. But immediately almost, we passed this ornery, uh, ridiculous, terrible bill called the Patriot Act. Now when I asked a member I was sitting next to why he was voting for the Patriot Act, and uh, I said, you know, there's nothing good in it. He says, well, I haven't read the whole thing, but you're right, there's not going to be anything good in it. I says, well, why are you going to vote for it? He says, well, how am I going to go home and right after this crisis, how am I going to go home and explain to them that I voted against the Patriot Act under these conditions? I said, well, why don't you do it? Because that's your job. Go home and explain it to them why it's a bad piece of legislation. That would make too much sense. So they, so they 
call it a Patriot Act, and that just adds fuels to making the members of Congress, uh, you know, reluctant to vote against it. But they should have called it Repeal the Fourth Amendment Act. Maybe we would have had a few more of us voting against it then. But the Patriot Act essentially has got the uh, the Fourth Amendment. Uh, there is uh, not much protection of privacy. They can look uh, look at any of our records now, and it's expanding rapidly without proper search warrants. So that that is the, one of the basic principles of a free society is privacy. Get the government out of our lives. We need to know what they're doing. They have no business knowing what we're doing. You know, on January, on January 1st this year, we had a few new laws passed on us. Probably, uh, these are uh, across the whole country. And who knows, you may have a few here in California passed on you on January 1st, too, because across the nation, there were 40,000 new laws passed. I'd like to be the first president to repeal 40,000 laws. the National Defense Authorization Act. I'm always pleased, I'm always pleased because so many of the crowds, of, matter of fact, all the crowds I speak to know about the National Defense Authorization Act, but also know you didn't learn about it on evening news. You had to get it from some other place to find out how bad it is. But here it is, uh, the Congress delivers to the President this authority to use the military to arrest American citizens and not charge them with anything, deny them attorney, and put them in a prison. And, and even on the Senate floor, there were senators saying they don't deserve a prisoners because they're guilty people, they're, they're terrorists, or they've been associated with. What has happened to the rule of law? These kind of things have to be reversed. That in particular, but I also think that we have to reverse this uh, attitude of the TSA agents at our airports. Yeah. The yeah. the uh, the defense for the Defense Production Act was written in 1950. It's been revised several times over the years, and it essentially gives the president declare in an emergency in times of war to nationalize everything. It's a terrible, terrible piece of legislation. It's been invoked partially, but never completely. But this, sometimes Congress, is, Congress renews it, other times it's passed, and this time, it, not correctly, obviously, but the president renewed it with an executive order. But he changed. There have been some times when this bill has been, uh, this law has been, uh, uh, you know, brought up and uh, and, and re, uh, re brought, you know reestablished, but they they do it uh, by saying that uh, they continue the same emergency powers. But guess what? In this executive order, he changed the rules. It isn't under emergencies of war conditions, but in peacetime conditions that he can declare that. I saw, I saw a report this week that obviously has to be wrong and can't be correct uh, because it was on the internet. You can't believe a thing you have on the internet, you know. <laughs> uh, but no, the internet, uh, th this article said that the uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security has sent out an order, and, and, uh, and this is probably true that they actually have, they sent out an order for a half a billion rounds of ammunition. This ammunition for. I thought the police were supposed to be local, not federal. We weren't supposed to have a federal police force. But there have been 
a lot, a lot of things happening with, with our civil liberties and of course our economic liberties have been under attack for a long time. We end up with an economic crisis, we end up with a foreign policy of perpetual war which contributes even further to our bankruptcy. But most of all, it's, it's this undermining of personal liberty in the name of safety. And we were warned about this. We, we were told if we're willing to give up some of our uh, some of our freedoms for wanting to be safe, that we're going to have neither. You know, and a lot of times you hear our president say, "Well, my job is to make you safe." Well, it'd be good. We have a national fence, and I understand that. But the job of the president is to take his oath seriously and obey the yeah. Constitution. Woo! And that is key. Romney doesn't know that shit. And Horn doesn't know that shit. And Obama doesn't know it. Our, our liberties are constantly being undermined. Even today, you know, if you might, uh, let's say there's a few of you here that think that it'd be worthwhile, whether you do it or not, it doesn't matter, but you might think somebody else should have the right to drink raw milk. <laughs> be involved in making that decision for you. So I think that uh, all your decisions should be your own, but you have to suffer all the consequences of if you make bad decisions too, but you ought to make your own decisions, not the government. Yeah. And when we restore the Republic, you'll be able to buy any kind of light bulb you want. You <laughs> and you know a little bit about farming and you want to go into the rope business, I'd let you make hemp rope. Woo! Hemp rope. And also I would respect this principle, I'd respect this principle of states' rights. If a state comes along and says that it is permissible under state law to use marijuana for medical reasons, I'll let you do it. and the most addicted drugs are prescription drugs. And also, I know a lot more people die from uh, nicotine cigarettes and alcohol, and yet uh, we haven't been putting people in there for smoking and, and drinking alcohol. If people do harm to others, yes. They deserve the punishment and they need to be put away if they're killing people and injuring people under the influence. But the whole thing is, if somebody wants to put something into their body that is potentially dangerous, the decision should be made by that individual but not by the government. <laughs> read the books. You can even read about these evil systems of government, that have, uh, tyrannical governments like communism and the millions of people they killed. We, but we refute those with better ideas. Even in our religious values, everybody can have their own choice of their religious values or none if they don't want it. So we don't try to tell people what they're supposed to do. on tangents with religious values as well as intellectual material. But why is it that we assume that there isn't anything that we put into our bodies we can't do it without the permission of the government? That hasn't been that for all our history. Matter of fact, it's very recent that this has come about. So I would say that we should assume responsibility for ourselves and make our own decisions. But I see this as the same decision as economic liberty. I want you not only to have the right ownership to your body to do what your body you want, I want you to be able to do with your money what you want as well. Thanks. 
principle of this is the understanding where liberty comes from. It doesn't come from our government. Why should they tell us how to use our liberty if they didn't give it to us? If anything, the government's supposed to protect our liberties. But I, I see liberty coming to us in a natural way or a God-given way. And it comes to us, we have our life and our liberty. But if that is true, shouldn't we have the right to keep the fruits of our labor? Somebody, if they're allowed to make up their own decision about their personal habits, they might do some dumb things. And the other argument about economics is, well, if we don't take care of the people, they're not going to be able to take care of themselves, and they're going to be hungry, and they won't have a house, and they won't have medical care, and they have to go on and on. But the whole thing is, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that because the more the government's involved, the worse those conditions get. Whether they're the economic conditions or look at, look at what the drug. Uh, war on drugs is done. The war on drugs has caused more harm than the drugs themselves. So obviously drugs are, are very dangerous, but I, I still believe that these decisions should be made by the individual. Before you know it, they'll be telling us what kind of food we can eat and how much salt we're allowed to have and how much exercise you have to do every day. It'll go on and on. worth something for us to live in a free society, making our own decisions, becoming the creative people that we're supposed to be. No, everybody won't become creative and productive, but most people will have a greater incentive to be creative and productive if they can't have a hand out. expression that you don't care about your fellow man because he's off to do something might hurt himself or you're not a humanitarian say oh well if you won't have the government being the lender of last resort and don't take care and, they, and nobody's going to take care of the people uh, then you don't have any humanitarian instincts but the whole thing is is when you expect the government to do it and people end up starving under those systems and bring us a crisis that we have today a crisis over our liberty a crisis in foreign policy a crisis in our economy how can they argue the case that they're the humanitarians? I would say that only freedom can deliver the maximum amount of goods and services to the maximum number of people. long way from our, our republic. It's, it's, uh, it's closer to pure democracy. As long as you get 51%, your rights re become relative. 51% tell you what to do, and therefore they can redistribute wealth until the wealth is, is, is gone. But democracy is, is, a t is something that the founders warned us against because they claimed this would be, uh, it would become very wasteful and it would erode the society and finally that society would self-destruct. And we're at that point now because the treasury's not there. The treasury's bare, the pie is shrinking and they're fighting with and clawing away at what's left of the pie and they have forgotten about how wealth is produced. Government does not produce wealth. They do not create wealth. We have to have a system where wealth is once again created. <laughs> years ago or so was that uh, people were uh, you know enjoying the benefits of a free society because a free society is very very productive and uh, there's great wealth. We were the freest and the wealthiest country ever, but we're not that today because we're the most indebted country ever. So what happened was we concentrated on the materialism that are the benefits of a free society. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying the benefits if you earn them. And uh, this is good. Because people are wealthy, we shouldn't condemn it. If they're wealthy because they live off the taxpayer and they have special privileges by the Federal Reserve and they have contracts with the government, that's a different story. <laughs> But 
concentrated on the wealth redistribution until until the wealth was was drained and we forgot about the principles of liberty and that's what this campaign is all about and that is what is necessary for us to restore the greatness of America this is what is necessary to restore the the benefits once again to be prosperous but also to restore something called uh, you, you know something uh, we would say uh, a sense of uh, a sense of respect for ourselves a sense of well-being because if a person gets wealthy uh, because or taken care of by somebody else they do not have this sense of self-respect as they do when they earn it themselves they have to have this incentive to do it and I believe it will be a healthy In a free society, I think it opens up the door for seeking that thing, those things called virtue and excellence. I think that's what our goals in life ought to be. Some people might not care too much about that, but as long as they lead their life the way they want and not bother anybody else, that's beside the point. But if, if you want to, seeking virtue and excellence and expanding oneself and being creative is very, very difficult in a totalitarian society because you spend most of your time just trying to survive, survive and getting around all the government regulations and surviving because they ruin the economy. So there's a big difference what happens in a free society, but we, we have been losing it. Uh, we have lost this free society and we have co become too dependent on our, our, on our government to provide all the goods and services. But the, the experiment, though, was something that is rather new, the experiment in liberty. Liberty is a young idea. Maybe that's why young people like the idea of freedom, because it's a young idea. It's a wonderful idea. frequently challenged and you will too and they, they'll say that you want to go back to the, the, the dark ages but tyranny is about part of the dark ages not freedom freedom is is new it's been tested only a few hundred years all we have to do is pick up the pieces where we left off approximately 80 100 years ago and refine it improve upon it we don't have to go back to anything even the gold standard of 19th century I believe in sound money and commodity money I don't believe in paper money but I believe there's an opportunity to even have a better uh, commodity standard of money. And I believe there's a better understanding of economic policies today. The Austrian free market economists have written in the 20th century tremendous things about So intellectually, intellectually the revolution is well on its way and uh, I think most of us realize that uh, when an idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by anybody, no army or no politician can stop us. No media outlet.